Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks for braving the first snow of the season. And so it begins. For some of you, that is the sign of dread. For some of you, maybe you're welcoming the, the cold and the snow. Either way, uh, we'll gather together and we'll worship this morning in expectation of the way the Lord is going to speak and move in our hearts. I invite you to stand as you're able to join us in our call to worship. Noah, come and lead us. Good morning. It's fun looking out and seeing all the, the fun sweaters. It's, it's sweater weather, I said to Scott this morning. Um, I invite you to join us for a call to worship this morning. This will be a responsive reading, so please join us as instructed on the screen. And if you have a neighbor standing next to you, this is a, a group participation. So, as we gather to worship today, turn to a neighbor and say to each other, Welcome. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Now, turn to another neighbor and say to each other, you are loved by God and by me. Beloved friends of God, how can we love each other today? By meeting and listening and caring for one another face to face. Beloved friends of God, how can we love God today? By practicing, by practicing our love for each one another and, and God, God with all our heart, soul, soul mind, and strength. Come, let us worship God together today. Sing a little louder and join the ancient melody. 
just has universal language. Um, no matter where you were from, you knew what a cornerstone was. Um, and I love that Jesus spoke in so many analogies that would span cultures and would span time as well. Father God, we're just so grateful to be in your house this morning. Thank you for the beauty of snow and thank you for the heart of people who are willing to brave the snow to come and worship your name. We want to spend just a couple of minutes in silence, God, just reveling in who you are. Jesus. Please join me in our corporate prayer this morning. The slides will be on the screen. Your holiness, O oh God, commands that we confess our sins and shortcomings before you and one another. So we confess we have fallen short of loving our neighbors as ourselves. We often fail to honor ourselves and others as your beloved creation. We have judged unjustly, regarded others ungenerously, profited at the losses of those near and distant, borne grudges, desired vengeance, and kept silent in the face of wrongdoing. We long to live in harmony with your way of compassion and kindness and honesty will govern our hearts and minds, turning us towards lives of peace. 
forgive us and lead us. Amen. And listen to this assurance. Brothers and sisters, the Holy One who promises forgiveness to those who seek the good hears your confession. As the crucified and risen child of God, your Redeemer fully knows your sorrow and your desire for reconciled relationships. You are forgiven. And that promise is the power to love your neighbors and yourselves as beloved of God who created all that exists. Join me in saying, thanks, thanks be, be to God. To God. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still in all of them. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name. Shall be. 
Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction.
beautiful worship, beautiful singing today. Thank you for being with us. Well, today being the Sunday closest to All Saints Day, it's customary around here to share in a moment of reflection. Of course, All Saints Day celebrates, you guys can be seated. <laughs> All Saints Day is a celebration that has uh, been a long tradition of the Christian church, and we're glad to join in this rich history this morning. As we, we remember the beloved saints that have gone before us, you know, as we think of those saints, whether we knew them or not, our first response might to be mourning or lament, and that's okay, that's all right, because we miss these folks. You know, there are many days where we wish we could call them or have them stop by or stop by their place and receive their counsel and their love. There's many moments when we long to see them and to be encouraged. The space that these loved ones held in our life is never filled in the same way. So we lean on God's grace and the community of one another, fellow believers, as we learn to live without their presence in quite the same way. In the Ecclesiasticus, a book canonized by the Catholic faith and one that's commonly used in Christendom on days like this, we hear the following reflection. Let us now sing the praises of famous men, our ancestors in their generations. The Lord apportioned to them great glory, his majesty from the beginning. There were those who ruled in their kingdoms and made their name for themselves by their valor. Those who gave counsel because they were intelligent and those who spoke prophetic words. Those who led the people by their counsels and by their knowledge of the people's lore. They were wise in their words of instruction. Those who composed musical tunes and put verses into writing. Rich men endowed with resources living peacefully in their homes. All those were honored in their generations and were the pride of their times. Some of them have left behind a name so that others may declare their praise, but others there is no memory of. They, were, they have perished as though they had never existed. They have become as though they had never been born, they and their children after them. But these also were godly men and women whose righteous deeds have not been forgotten. Their offspring will continue forever and their glory will never be blotted out. Their bodies are buried in peace, but their name lives on generation after generation. So now in this moment, we want to pause and remember the saints who have shaped our lives. Perhaps they have a day marked for themselves on the Christian calendar, like St. Francis of Assisi, who gave us a beautiful prayer that says, make me an instrument of your peace. But more likely, the people who are coming to mind for you don't have a day marked on the calendar, except maybe your own. But their memory lives on in your own heart. On this day, it's customary to light a candle for our past beloved. Unlike other streams of faith, we don't light a candle so that they can find their way. We light a candle to reflect the glory, the beauty that they held in our lives. Because candles signify hope. They represent Christ as the light and his light, which shines brightly in those they have impacted our lives. So in just a moment, as the music begins to play, I invite you to take your time and to reflect on those departed saints in your lives. Those who modeled Christ's love while guiding you in your life and in your faith journey. You might offer a prayer for them, thanking God for their life, their impact in your life. You might also simply cherish fond memories that you shared with these individuals. This is a great activity to do with one another. Parents, this is a good activity to do with your children, or if you're sitting next to someone near, this is a good thing to just kind of softly talk through. There's an insert in your bulletin that has a few prompts, a few questions that you can go through. You may, of course, go through those by yourselves, or you can go through those together with someone, just kind of 
quietly talking through those stories and those memories. And finally, I invite you, when the moment feels right, we'll take a few moments here, when the time feels right, you're welcome to come and to light a candle for these individuals. I'd invite you to come and take a single candle. I know some of us may be lighting a candle for more than one person today, but maybe we'll just kind of light one candle for the, all those who have impacted our lives. You'll receive a flame from the Christ candle in the middle, and then you'll place your wax candle in the sand in the table to the side. As we prepare to light candles in honor of our departed saints, I invite you to join me in praying this prayer. It'll be on the screens. Let us pray this together. Almighty God, you have knit together the faithful in one communion and fellowship in a mystical body of your Son. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living that we may come to the joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. Come, let us honor the memory of our departed saints.
Well, thanks for joining in that moment. I hope that's meaningful for you. Honestly, before I came to Emmaus, participating in All Saints Day was just not something I'd ever done before. Um, and I've come to find great value in that moment. It's kind of inevitable that at some point, in some way, we experience loss throughout the year. So doing this annually is, yeah, beneficial. Well, as we uh, transition here, children are staying with us today. It's a, it's a um, family Sunday. So we don't have the transition of passing of the peace, but if you'd like, you can turn to someone and say, the peace of Christ be with you and respond and also with you. Grace, the peace of Christ be with you. <laughs> There's a couple of little things in uh, the, the opening pages of your uh, worship folder, just some of the announcements. We have First Friday fun night coming very soon, this coming Friday. And Advent Conspiracy, we're continuing to discuss about Advent Conspiracy. Uh, at the end of November, in just a few weeks, we will be celebrating Christ the King Sunday as the final day on the Christian calendar. And that coincides with our hanging of the green service. That's always an exciting, fun Sunday to be here. You won't want to miss it. That's a great Sunday to invite people to come because it's a very unique experience. Uh, so it, as we prepare for hanging of the greens, we do have our Chrismon kits. I think most of you are familiar with these. They're on the table in the back. But these kits give a few instructions along with the template that you can use to decorate a chrismon that we will use on that Sunday at the end of November to uh, place on our Christ tree on the, on the stage here. So, of course, these kits are just recommendations. Of course, you can use the, the paperboard here or you can kind of get creative and go on your own. So if you do, it should be good. We'll see how that goes. Anyway. Thank you for that. So over the last few weeks, we've been following the adventure of the nation of Israel as the Lord has led them out of Egypt toward the promised land. And during the ups and downs and the experiences, you know, we've been gleaning the core tenets of what it means to be the people of God. Things like embracing the mystery of the kingdom, even though we tend to look for answers and we want certainty, the invitation of the kingdom is often into a place of uncertainty. Things like recognizing the presence of God in our lives through the pattern that he gave to us, not only through the Ten Commandments, but through the pattern of the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and the life of Jesus. And that that pattern, along with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, makes a difference. Things like not settling for man-made approximations of God and the kingdom. That that tends to get us in trouble. And then finally, in insisting on the presence of God in our lives, the way Moses did as he spoke with God face to face. Through the anointing and communion of the Holy Spirit in our lives. While many of these concepts are not new, they are the core affirmations of our faith, of what it means to be the people of God. And it is true that we often need to remind ourselves of these basic truths. And so we tell these stories. We go through these cycles each year. This is because so often the quiet basic truths of our lives can tend to be drowned out by the noise, can't they? This last week... I was listening to a podcast, and as I say that, I recognize that I, I often say that here. <laughs> I often say I was listening to a podcast, but I was listening to a podcast uh, between two uh, online journalists, and they were trying to discuss how to remain sane while using the internet. I don't know. You see, both were lamenting about how the internet is such a vital part of their job, their life and their work, but how living online so much, especially in the darker corners of the web like Twitter <laughs> and other social media platforms, they, it left them feeling discouraged and depressed oftentimes. You know, both were describing their coping mechanisms for remaining sane while living and working online so much. And one of the presenters said something that really hit home. I've been thinking about it ever since. 
They said, the problem is that everything is so noisy, we're losing our ability to hear ourselves think. In other words, we're so constantly surrounded by input, phones, TVs, radios, traffic, music, podcasts, notifications, reminders, schedules, appointments. We're so full of input that we run the risk of forgetting who we really are. We're running the risk of losing the ability to think for ourselves. Our ability to hear, but then to process and to learn and to remember the core tenets of who we are and who we were made to be is essential to the job description of a follower of Christ. It's our purpose in life. The reason why we are here, the position which we have been entrusted to fill. You know, this is what we hope to pursue in the coming weeks. We're beginning kind of a new series here leading us up to Advent. For we truly have been entrusted with the work of the kingdom of God. The sermon graphic on the front of your bulletin comes from uh, the painter Scott Erickson. It's, it's a modern icon, if you will. And it's entitled, The Commissioning of Peter. You guys should take that out and look at it. What are some of the things you see in that piece of art? I don't have one in front of me. There it is. I mean, of course, we see Christ with the shepherd's hook and Peter with the fish. Christ is handing Peter a, a set of keys, and it looks like a city or something on top of the keys, holding the olive branch, the yoke. I love all the symbolism in here. We can kind of think about this, and we'll kind of bring some of these up in the weeks to come. But we really have been entrusted with the key, keys of the kingdom of heaven. We've been given a job to do. And our passages today provide us examples of people like you and I who've been entrusted to carry out the work of the kingdom of heaven. But they were not left unequipped. They weren't left to just, okay, good luck. <laughs> you know what I mean? They got some on-the-job training. Our passages provide us with these examples. They were provided with all they needed to succeed. And so were you. So were you. In one sense, this sermon today will be one of the most basic messages of the Christian faith. But these verses, with all the, you know, these verses will all be familiar to you. But I love the way that this is framed in our lectionary passages this morning. These are the lections for today. Before we dive into the passages, let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, in the word of God, as the breath of life, amidst your people gathered here, in our hearts and our minds, stir us to know the happiness of life in your blessings. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we will be begin in Exodus chapter 33 as we're closing out the story of Moses. It says, Then Moses went up to Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab and climbed Pisgah Peak, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land from Gil Gilead as far as Dan, all the land of, Nath of Nastphali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah extending to the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, the, Va the Jordan Valley with Jericho, the city of Palms as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to Moses, This is the land that I promised in oath with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have not, uh, I have not allowed you to see it. I have now allowed you to see it with your own eyes. But you will not enter the land. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him in the valley near Beth. Peor in Moab, but to this day, no one knows the exact place. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyesight was clear, and he 
was as strong as ever. The people of Israel mourned for Moses on the plains of Moab for 30 days until the customary period of mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. So the people of Israel obeyed him, doing just as the Lord had commanded to Moses. You know, one thing that's interesting that I'm thinking of right, now, right at this point, we know Moses to be the author of the book of Exodus, but how could he have penned those words of his own departing? I imagine Joshua picked up the pen and carried on. Anyway, that's a side note. But we followed Moses from his birth through the angst of his youth, his reluctant leadership phase into the trusted friend of God maturity phase, and now to his death. And just as we have followed along the journey with Moses, so too have the people of God. And so too has his closest friends and his disciples like Joshua. Could you imagine how Joshua felt now in charge of these people, bringing them into the land? I mean, those are pretty big sandals to fill, right? Perhaps you can remember the first days of a new job or the first days of a new school year. Those were days full of pouring over the syllabus or the employee handbook, hearing your teacher lay out all the things that you would be learning and all the things that would be expected of you for the semester, or perhaps you're watching training videos or working alongside of someone shadowing, learning the duties of this new job that you were hired to do. Well, how would it go if after the first few days or the first few weeks of this new semester or this new job, you just kind of took that syllabus or that employee handbook and tore it up and threw it out the window? You took all of those things that you were trained and learned to do, and you just kind of said, you know what, I'm just going to figure out my own way. I'm just going to do it on my own. I'm going to wing it. <laughs> I'm just going to go with the flow of the students or the coworkers around me. You know, if you, if you made that approach, you, you might be lucky. It might be okay, but only in as much as you had good examples around you who were doing the right things and uh, remembering the training for themselves. But most likely, you would find yourself given over to a culture which has lost its way. Joshua had a choice to make. Would he remain faithful to all the training and teaching that he had received under the discipleship of Moses? Would he lead the people with the same tenacity, clean to the basic truths of love, justice, and mercy, or would he begin chasing the noise around him? The followers of Jesus had the same choice to make. Would they follow the distractions and the noise, even of the religious culture in which they found themselves, or would they cling to the core tenets of faith? In Matthew chapter 22, we hear a story that goes like this. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. And one of them, an expert on the religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all, of the, the, and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. You know, we return to this familiar passage from Matthew often. Because I think so often we need reminding of what is the basic truth of the kingdom? What exactly is it that we're supposed to be doing? You know, these Pharisees, like us, are simply trying to do their best. They're simply trying to carry on the work of the kingdom and the work of the church as best they know it. But gradually, over time, over generations, the tendency is to kind of lose some of the simplicity of the gospel as it's amended and tweaked to suit whims and fancies. You know, then Jesus comes along and begins to threaten the foundations which they had propped up on this scaffold of behaviors and appearances and assurances of who is in and who is out. 
And so they try to expose Jesus for the charlatan that apparently he is to be, you know, with all of this simple talk of love and kindness and mercy and justice. And you know what's great about Jesus' answer is he doesn't go off script. This expert in the law would have known that. As a matter of fact, these two simple statements, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor, are taken directly verbatim from the Torah scriptures, from the laws of Moses that they were trying to trap Jesus with. Last week, kids, you remember this, last week, uh, you learned about the Shema in kids' church, didn't you? Last week, the kids studied this passage. They did an activity on this passage. Let's say this together. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, why don't we all join in these first couple of verses? Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And what I love about this passage are the few verses that actually follow this. I mean, that's great, but these few passages that follow this are so important because they remind us who we are. <laughs> you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commandments that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you, when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Pastor Grace last week prepared a craft for the kids. You know, and they wrote the Shema on a little passage or on a little scrap of paper. And they rolled it up and they put it in a little box affixed to a headband. So they could literally wear these words on their foreheads. I love that. Such a good practical example of loving the Lord your God. You know, and Jesus does the same thing for us because God is relational, altogether relational. Jesus understood that in order to fully love God, the, the, the Shema, the first command, in order to fully love God, that we needed to put ourselves alongside our neighbors in order to live that out. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this too comes from the Hebrew law. It is taken from Leviticus chapter 19. Let us look at these verses. The Lord also said to Moses, give the following instruction to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Do not twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor and being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge people fairly. Do not spread slanderless gossip among your people. Do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so that you will not be held guilty of their sin. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Those were just a few verses from chapter 19. Those were the lectionary verses from chapter 19. But this chapter is saturated with so many practical ways on how to live a holy life, an anointed life in communion with the Holy Spirit. You must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. For us, that seems impossible. As a matter of fact, holiness perhaps has gotten a bad rap lately, because we assume that to be holy means that we're, that we're perfect, that we'll never make a mistake, that we're infallible. But this passage isn't saying it that way. This passage is giving us things to be aiming for, and the Holy Spirit guides us in that. So what does it mean to be holy? Well, it means lots of things, but one way to boil it down in its most basic 
simple truth, as Jesus said, is to love your neighbor as yourself. As Joshua considers what he should do next, as the disciples gathered around Jesus to hear the admonition to not complicate or skew the gospel, as Peter is commissioned by Jesus to feed my sheep, so too we have been commissioned and we have been called to remember. You know, Jesus not only knows the Torah, he also knew the human heart and our ability to do what is right. It's rooted in right resemblance of God. You shall be holy because the Lord your God is holy. This refrain occurs over and over in chapter 19, cementing the connection between the things that we do and the identity that we carry because we need reminding. God does not ask us to do what we cannot do. Made in the image of God, we share in God's holiness. That is the Imago Dei. God has placed within us what we need to do his will and what we need to be holy. Furthermore, God has placed us in communities of support and giving us teachings and guidance and the Holy Spirit to come alongside and guide us in this work. Whenever, whatever sinfulness, wherever it comes from, whatever drives it, it's less fundamental to the human nature than holiness. People can be sinful, but our Lord God is not sinful. Therefore, we can be holy because God is holy. How do we do this? Well, we had a list there. There's more in chapter 19. Don't be partial. Always judge fairly. Don't lie or gossip or slander. Don't be idle when you have the ability to help, help others in word or deed. Don't nurse contempt or hate for anyone. Be honest and charitable in your disputes and your discourse with one another. Learn to disagree in love by not isolating yourself with people who only affirm your own convictions. Take time to learn one another's preferences. And even when those preferences are different than our own, learn to live and to work within those preferences. Don't be vengeful. Don't hold grudges. I'm paraphrasing a bit from verses 15 through 18 of Leviticus. Uh, you know, because we could teach a month worth of sermons just from those passages, right? But if you're like me, even in my modest, relatively balanced exposure to the news and to media, you've had plenty of examples. You've heard plenty of examples of every one of these admonitions this week. The truth is we are surrounded by stories of revenge, by stories of lying, by stories of slander, disputes, vengeance, revenge, but in the midst of all this noise, can we remember who we were made to be? You must be holy because I am holy. I am the Lord your God. And remember what we were made to do, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And this week, I might challenge you to spend a little time in Leviticus 19. <laughs> to spend a little time looking over those verses Maybe choosing one, it's a challenge for you. It's like going to the gym. When you first do those push-ups or whatever, your squats, it doesn't feel good. But over time, you start to learn. A word of encouragement, don't be overwhelmed by the scale of the task. If you struggle with these signs of holiness in your life, the last thing God wants for you is to be crushed under a load of shame and guilt. The one thing God desires more than anything else is that we come alongside and say, Lord, help me. Fill me with your spirit. Help me in this way. And as the Holy Spirit refines our, refines our thoughts and our desires and our motivations in alignment with Leviticus 19 and all of the teaching of Christ, we are walking hand in hand, face to face with the God who loves us and cares for us. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And while we're at it, sharing the greatest hits of some of my favorite passages this morning, I leave you with a final. The Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Thanks be to God. Well, as we prepare to gather around the Lord's table this morning, for those worshiping at home, this would be the perfect time to gather elements that represent the body and blood of Christ. We invite you to join us at the table. Open our eyes, O Lord Jesus, to receive your light and to be your light. May we see you in this common bread and in our common lives, in our hunger and our fullness, in our suffering and our joys, in our waiting and our hope. Feed us also with bread unseen. Open our hearts, Lord, and fill our cups to overflowing. Prepare your table of blessing even in the presence of our enemies. And may we reflect your light to the world with compassion for the poor, and passion for justice and liberation for the oppressed. Pour for us the cup of heaven. We invite you to come to the Lord's table, you who are longing for God's face, you who are weary from the world, you who have fed on the bread of sorrow, you who have quenched your thirst with tears. Come, for the table is ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. As we gather around the Lord's table, I invite you to join me in proclaiming the mystery of our faith by saying, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. In just a moment, we'll prepare the elements and we'll invite you to come and receive. You know, I don't express this often. Maybe I should. But as we come to this table, it is a response. Um, we're all family. This is a small group here. Many people say, why don't we do the good old-fashioned altar calls anymore? Well, this is the altar call. We do it every week. Sure, we don't have the furniture right in the front the way we used to, but we do have altars on the side. If for you, a unique body posture is the right way to respond to the message this morning, these altars are always open. For you, if receiving prayer from someone, whether myself or whether a trusted friend would be an appropriate response for you, I hope you feel comfortable to say, would you mind praying for me? Here's what I'm going through. This is what we do in this moment of response. So as we come and receive these elements and then as you return to your seats in a moment of prayer, please pray in whatever way is most appropriate for the way the Holy Spirit is guiding you this morning. Let's gather at the Lord's table.
Having experienced together the generosity of Christ by gathering around his table, we so enact that generosity in our own lives through devotion and giving. Thank you so much for all of your faithfulness to continue to contribute to this work and this ministry. Of course, we encourage you to continue in that. And we have giving boxes in the foyer. There's instructions on how to give online. If you ever find yourself in a moment of need, you can see even in the bottom of our bulletin, we continue to contribute to our care fund. And those funds are set aside for you, set aside to come alongside of one another in moments of financial tightness. Perhaps there's an opportunity coming that you might not even consider like a major one. Maybe there's a conference you'd like to go to or a retreat or something like that. Please let us know if there's a moment of financial difficulty in your lives. We'd love to come alongside. You'll notice that we have the FFH contribution boxes. Those will remain in the foyer throughout November. Uh, there are on the back table some of those leaflets with the type of items that they are receiving. If you have a question, ask Noah. He can help you out. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin 
and pierces it with many griefs. We're determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have and laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but shine in the age to come. Amen. Amen. Bob, come and lead us. invite you to find an appropriate position of prayer for yourself. We will conclude the prayer time by reciting the Lord's Prayer together. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. You made your glory higher than heaven. When we look up at your skies, at what your fingers made, the moon and the stars you set firmly in place, what are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? You made us only slightly less than divine, crowding us with glory and grandeur. You let us rule over your handiwork, putting, us, putting everything under our feet, all sheep and all cattle, wild animals too, the birds of the sky, the fish of the ocean, everything that travels the pathways of the sea. Lord, you are good, and you do what is right. You show us the proper path when we go astray. You lead the humble in doing right, teaching us your way. You lead us with unfailing love and faithfulness, helping us to keep your covenant and follow your demands. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout all the earth. Lord, you are the giver of all good things, and so we take this time to thank you for all that you have given to us. I thank you for the, the snow this morning, for the beauty that you put in the world for us to enjoy. I thank you for your people who gather together, in spite of bad weather, to love and uplift you, your name. We are thankful that you placed us in this community of faith where we find support and guidance for our life. Thank you for your word and your commandments. They give us understanding and are a lamp to guide our feet and a light for our path. We also give thanks for the guidance and power of your Holy Spirit who works within us and among us to make us more and more holy like Jesus. Reflect for a moment to silently consider all the other good things that God has provided for you and give thanks. Lord, most of all, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his dying through which he overcame death and for his rising to life again and who promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age. Lord, you told us that if we ask anything according to your will, you will provide what we need. So we offer to you our request. Lord, we lift up our world with the many conflicts, the many wars. We ask that you would bring peace and you would bring us peace. Lord, grant us grace to always remember to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before you. Show us when, where, and how we might better love you and our neighbors, that we might follow in your ways and be a blessing to our world. 
In your mercy, we ask that you would guide the nations of the world into the way of justice and truth and establish among them your peace. Lead us from prejudice to truth. Deliver us from hatred, cruelty, and revenge and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. We pray for those across the world who are suffering from wars and violence. We pray for the victims and friends and families left behind. In all, the, in all their troubles, look with compassion upon them. Strengthen those who work to rescue and repair. Comfort those who have lost their loved ones. In your mercy, look upon those in our congregation, our friends and family who suffer from sickness or disease. We pray for those who are battling cancer or suffering from chronic disease and infirmity or those facing unexpected health problems. Let us take a moment to add our own silent request to these that have been mentioned. Now, Lord, as members of your kingdom, we remember and pray together the prayer that you taught your first disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. It has been a pleasure to worship with you as we have worshiped together in song and in word and gathering at the table and in prayer. I now invite you to hold out your hands as we receive this commission inspired by our worship today. Go now with courage in our God. Declare the message of the gospel which God entrusted to us. And in wholehearted love for God and for others, share not only the gospel, but your very selves in word and deed. And may God be your haven. May Christ Jesus lead you into love, heart, soul, and mind. And may the Holy Spirit bless the work of your hands and gladden all your days. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Daniel, will you lead the doxology? Let us close with singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him, above the heavenly host. Praise You are dismissed.